Good morning. It's 11.01 on this 20th day of July, 2023. And the 20th Lourdes Manahan Lectures in Rheumatology is now streaming to you live from the University of the Philippines, Manila. I'm Dr. Hazel Manapat Reyes of the Division of Rheumatology here at UPPGH, and I will be your moderator for this session. So thank you to the 997 attendees who are now joining us in Zoom. I would like to thank our sponsors, Novartis and Celtrion, and all of our participants for joining us today. You may pose your questions anytime during their talks at the Q&A box, and we will be addressing them after our two speakers have completed their talks and during the open forum. You will also receive your cert a certificate of attendance a week after you submit the evaluation form and post-test, so please look out for the link for that. This is the fourth year that we are doing LMLR online, and today will be the third of our webinar series for this year. The Lourdes Manahan Lectures in Rheumatology aim to capacitate healthcare, prof healthcare professionals in caring for patients with rheumatologic conditions, conditions, an advocacy initiated by Dr. Lourdes Manahan, the first Filipino rheumatologist. This year's theme is Life to the Max. We wish to emphasize a holistic understanding of our patients and their diseases, as well as strategies through which we can make our patients' lives better. LMLR is conducted in support of the WHO Sustainable Development Goal 3 on Health and, Wellness and Well-Being and SDG 4 on Quality Education. The Division of Rheumatology is also happy to sharing that we have two book publications that are already available, The Atlas of the Rheumatic Diseases in the Philippines and The Physician's Guide in Tele-Rheumatology. Um, these are contacts for those who wish to purchase copies of these very useful publications. Our talks today will focus on the many issues of back pain, very common complaint, the warning signs that we must know, appropriate use of imaging and other diagnostic tests, and pain control strategies for patients with back pain. We're deeply honored to have two distinguished speakers, both of whom trained in our institution. Our first speaker is Dr. Dave Dison. Dave completed his residency in orthopedics in UPPGH. He had his training in bone and cartilage transplantation and joint revision surgery in the Brisbane Private Hospital and the Queensland Bone Bank in Brisbane, Australia. He also had his training in spine surgery in Clinicum Carlsbad Lanchenstein back in Germany, and I'm sure I've pronounced that wrong. He's currently a clinical associate professor at the UPPGH and is the training officer of the Division of Spine Surgery in the same institution. Dave is an active consultant in several hospitals in Manila, such as PGH, the Asian Hospital, QualiMed in Santa Rosa, and Manila Doctors. Our second speaker is none, none less than Dr. Sandra Tanque Torres. Dr. Tanque Torres completed her fellowship training in rheumatology in UPPGH and was an Appler Scholar in Rheumatology in the Royal Melbourne Hospital in Australia. She also earned a degree of Master of Science in Clinical Epidemiology in UP Manila. She's currently the Executive Director of the Philippine College of Physicians Foundation. Dr. Torres was past president of the Philippine Rheumatology Association, is an active consultant in Cardinal Santos Medical Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dizon and Dr. Tanke Torres as they share their expertise in today's lectures. The floor is now Dr. Dizon's. Morning. Thank you to my friends at the Division of Rheumatology for inviting me again to participate in the Lourdes Manahan Lecture Series. Today, I was tasked to talk about red flags in low back pain. I have no relevant disclosures. At the end of this talk, I hope to be able to meet these objectives. 
A few years ago, Mr. LG consulted me in my clinic. I'm sure most of you have encountered patients with a similar history. He fell from one of those poorly made monoblock chairs where one of the legs suddenly bent. The pain was really bad and he could barely get up from his wheelchair. We'll go back to him later on. Back pain is a very common problem. 84% of the world population has experienced low back pain at some point in their life. And the thing is, even after the initial episode, anywhere between 44 to 78% of patients will have recurrence of the pain. And about 26 to 30% will have to take time off work because of the relapse. And it can be quite frustrating that most patients cannot be given a precise pathoanatomic diagnosis. There is no gender predilection, and the age group most commonly affected are those in the working age, making it the most common cause of back pain, uh, most common cause of work-related disability in people below 45. Clinic clinical practice guidelines can guide you in your evaluation and management, and there are multiple CPGs available online. This um, is one from the ACP and APS, and it's one of the more widely used uh, CPGs. They recommend that you do a focused history and physical exam, and you try to classify your patients into nonspecific low back pain, radicular pain, or pain from another specific spinal cause. So this is important because if you can find the cause, then you can give a more directed treatment. As you do your evaluation, keep the differentials in mind. In the paper by Deo and Weinstein, 97% of patients consulted due to mechanical back pain with visceral and mechanical issues comprising a measly 3% combined. A look at the pie of mechanical low back pain shows that lumbar strains and sprains will comprise almost three-fourths of consults with everything else Disc degeneration, spondylolisthesis, trauma comprising little more than a quarter of the pie. While fractures comprise a small percentage, they can be quite serious and may need to be addressed immediately. Now, this is the 1%. Among the non-mechanical spinal conditions, the majority of Deo and Weinstein's population were due to neoplasia, followed by inflammatory arthritis, and then a small percentage of infections. It might be different in the Philippines. I'm not sure if we have the data for that. And while not common, it is important to keep these entities and their key clinical presentations in mind as you do your evaluation, since their consequences can be serious and have a great impact on your patient. During the initial evaluation, most doctors are tempted to order for imaging right away, but is it necessary? In this second recommendation, you do not need to get routine imaging in patients if they only have nonspecific low back pain. And in the third recommendation, imaging is warranted if the patient has signs hinting at specific, um, at serious underlying conditions. In other words, take note of any red flags, which may suggest a serious underlying condition causing the back pain. Most CPGs for low back pain have a list of red flags to watch out for. One of the newer ones by the North American Spine Society just published last 2020, um, they cite what to look for in the history and the physical examination. In general, you want to rule out a fracture, malignancy, or infection, and significant neurologic compromise, particularly called the Equina syndrome. Verhagen et al. Collated CPGs on low back pain and reviewed the cited red flags. All guidelines recommended screening for serious pathologies using red flags. Aside from fracture, malignancy, infection, and coda equina syndrome, other pathologies referred to were spondyloarthropathy, aneurysm, myelopathy, and severe spondylolisthesis. Regarding malignancy, 14 red flags were mentioned. The ones mentioned in almost all guidelines were a history of cancer, unexplained or unintentional weight loss, and pain, whether at rest or at night. There were 11 red flags related to fractures. 
mentioned in all but one was major or significant trauma. And most guidelines cited use of steroids or immunosuppressors and old age also. For infection, 13 red flags were cited. The most frequently mentioned were fever, use of steroids or immunosuppressants, IV drug use, and um, different presentations of pain. Nine red flags were recommended for CODA equina syndrome, but the most frequently mentioned were its hallmarks of saddle anesthesia or perennial numbness and the sudden onset of bladder dysfunction. The authors note though that although all guidelines present red flags and recommend their use for, to screen for serious pathology, only a few provide evidence for their diagnostic accuracy. This is a Cochrane review on red flags to screen for malignancy in patients with low back pain. And um, they found that there was only one red flag which was noted to have a sufficiently high likelihood ratio for malignancy, that of a patient with a previous history of cancer. This is another Cochrane review, this time for um, red flags for vertebral fractures. A few were noted to have a meaningful likelihood ratio range. In the primary care setting, it was the prolonged use of corticosteroids, significant trauma, and age greater than 24. In the tertiary care setting, they added contusions and abrasions um, at the back. The authors noted, however, that by combining red flags, um, the likelihood of a fracture increased such as uh, if you combine trauma along with neurological signs or female gender along with older age. And this was also noted in the systematic review from Italy, where individual red flags were noted to have a low likelihood ratio, but the likelihood increases with the use of a combination of red flags. And so we go back to Mr. LG. He has red flags. He is older than 74, and while the trauma may be trivial, relative to his age, where he may have osteoporosis, the trauma could be significant enough for a fragility fracture. And this being the case, do we now order for the imaging? Rehab published a revision of their guidelines in low back pain in 2017. In general, they do not recommend it for nonspecific low back pain at the initial consult. However, an x-ray may be requested if there is no improvement or even worsening of the symptoms even before you order for an MRI. And in this review by Oliveira, all guidelines internationally are in agreement against the routine use of imaging for nonspecific low back pain. Most guidelines will tell you to request for it only if red flags are present and if the results will affect the patient's treatment, such as an epidural steroid injection for a patient with radiculopathy from a disc protrusion. Two guidelines say to do imaging if pain persists beyond four weeks. And why so? Because we know from the natural history studies on back pain that 80 to 90% of patients will recover in six weeks, regardless of the administration or type of treatment. So in summary, imaging is not needed in the first six weeks if there are no red flags present. After six weeks, a plain orthogonal x-ray is sufficient. And this is because most pathologies should manifest itself on a plain AP lateral x-ray. And uh, while we're on the subject of x-rays, this is a reading from radiology that's very alarming for a lot of patients and some general practitioners. And this sends uh, the patient with back pain to the orthopedic surgeon's clinic um, very much alarmed. What does it mean exactly?
Uh, we're aware that we're having some problems with the audio. So we're trying to address that right now and we'll make sure to backtrack from the time that it was uh, uh, disrupted. We're all sharing the number from my end. Para... Uh, yeah. So Dr. Dizon, can you take over? Because um, I, we can't get the audio from where we are. Thank you. Just enough. While we're waiting for Dr. Deason to onboard, thank you for your patience. Uh, we have a lot of questions uh, in the chat about CPD credits. Yes, this are C we've applied for and are approved for CPD credits uh, in the uh, with with PRC. So you will be getting your certificates and you can present them for CPD credits. So we are just uh, fixing the audio right now. Dave, are you? Are yeah, you uh, I'm, just, I'm just locating where the slide is. Um, so we start at predisposition two. Yeah, here we go. So now resume. Share screen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you unshare so I can share my screen? So I think Dave, we left off from. Uh, so far, we've covered no how important it is to have a focus history. And that the focus history suggestive of can be suggestive of infections, malignancy, inflammatory conditions, neurologic disease, and fractures. I think what was very interesting is the combinations of red flags are particularly suspicious rather than just one finding. You've already informed about about how to use X-rays selectively. No, and these are in cases where there is persistent pain, worsening pain, or red flags. So I think we we paused at slide eighteen. Okay, so you can see my slides now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll just take over live. Um, yes, lumbar instability. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So this is something that I get from a lot of uh, patients. And so since we're on the subject of uh, plain x-rays anyway, when you get these x-rays, you send them to radiology, patient will come back with a, the patient will come back with a reading of predisposition to lumbar instability. So from what I understand, what that means is um, if you were to drop a line straight down from L3, that would signify your center of gravity. And it should fall just right at the sacral promontory. Now, in sometimes in patients who have a straightening of the lumbar lordosis, that drop line can move a bit forward. Okay, so that means that your center of gravity is moving forward, and the radiologist will call this as a predisposition to lumbar instability. It has nothing to do with biomechanical instability. Your spine will still be biomechanically stable. There's no fracture, dislocation, or anything like that. But for whatever reason, the radiologists have termed this as a predisposition to lumbar instability, and the patient usually comes to the clinic very alarmed. So most patients would usually just require some degree of reassurance that their spine is stable, it's just um, most likely muscular back pain, and they should get better with, um, medic with medication, physical therapy, lifestyle mods, and all that. Okay. 
And another thing that uh, will send the patient to the clinic is if they have an X-ray with uh, where it was read that they have scoliosis, and they would think that um, siguro kaya sumasakit ng likod ko. But uh, studies have shown that um, same as the general population, patients with scoliosis can also have back pain. And the reason for the back pain is actually the same as with the general population, which is muscular strain. And pain actually does not seem to be an issue for the majority of patients with scoliosis. Um, they have found no correlation between the size of the curve and back pain. The only correlation that they have found is actually between self-image and back pain. So going back to uh, Mr. LG, our 80-year-old male with a history of fall. So I had x-rays done eventually. Uh, I had x-rays done soon after, given that he had red flags. And um, we saw that he had a compression fracture of L4. Everything else were just spondylotic changes, which are not really very surprising for an 80-year-old. So what's next? Um, in the APS clinical guidelines, they mentioned that in patients who have radiculopathy or spinal stenosis, um, then maybe it's time to do uh, an MRI, particularly if uh, you think that the patient will need surgery or uh, probably at least an invasive procedure like an epidural steroid injection. Um, and this is more because uh, the interventionist or the surgeon will need the MRI to plan what uh, he or she needs to do, locate the area of the impingement so that the surgery or the intervention can be done properly. And when we did the MRI for Mr. LG, this is what we found. There actually were changes at L34, hypo-intense on T1, the disc was hyper-intense on T2, and the bodies were hyper, even more hyper-intense on the stair. So it's actually looking more like an infection at this point. So uh, I referred this patient to interventional radiology um, and a CT-guided biopsy was done, which uh, showed a histopath, which was compatible with TB. The PCR was positive for mycobacterium TB also, no resistance or fantasin, and the TB culture eventually came out, which showed no um, drug resistance. So the patient was treated with anti-TB medication, and one year later, uh, comes walking back to the clinic unassisted, no significant pain, um, no problems whatsoever. So this led to very good outcomes for um, our patient. And that was because we were able to pick up those red flags right away. Now, um, it's also useful to know that there are such things as yellow flags, which are more on the psychological aspect. So these are patients with unstable personalities, those who may benefit from secondary gain. And um, noting yellow flags is actually more significant for uh, clinical outcomes. Although this is another talk by itself, so maybe we can talk about this in a future uh, LMLR. So in summary, back pain is a very common problem with less than 15% of cases having an identifiable cause. Be on the lookout for red flags. Um, the diagnostic accuracy of most red flags is questionable, but uh, based on systematic reviews, those with a promising likelihood ratio would be a history of cancer for patients with malignancy. For trauma, the use of corticosteroids, um, the history of significant trauma, um, age more than 74, and uh, findings of contusions or abrasions uh, at the back after a fall. And it's very important to note that a combination of red flags will actually increase your likelihood of um, an actual pathology for your patient. Imaging is only needed if your patient does not improve after six weeks of treatment, if we're just talking about non-specific back pain. But if you, have, if, you're, if you have red flags, especially multiple red flags, then you might need imaging. And particularly if you're contemplating anything invasive, then you might need imaging. So that's all for this topic. Uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions later on. Thank you. Si Richard Dumapetamaya, 
47 years old. Ang uh, diagnosis po ko since 2018 sa PGL, Philippine General Hospital ng AS, Aquilosis Spondylitis. Uh, that time, na, nag-work din po ako. So, nung naka-experience ako ng ganitong sakit, so, yung mga nagagawa ko noon, hindi ko na po nagagawa ngayon. Na, kung magkaroon naman ng limit, pero tuloy pa rin, uh, nag-work pa rin kahit may pain. Okay po. Ang asawa ko po ay eh, na-stroke po noong January 2017. Tapos nakahiga lang po siya, hindi po makabangon. Pinaterapy po namin sa rehab. Ngayon po, uh, after 3 months, uh, nakakatayo na po siya, nakakalakad. Tapos unti-unti na pong nakakapunta sa farm, nakakalakad po na nakatungkod. At nakakadrive din po. Kaya lang po, after 5 years, sumakit po ulit yung tuhod niya, tsaka po yung back, nagkaroon po siya ng back pains, hanggang hindi po siya makalakad. At dinala po namin siya dito kay doktora. After one week po, uh, nakalakad po siya ulit. Tapos, so, yung epekto po ng back pain sa buhay ko, Bilang isang 22 years old, eh, madidevend ko po sa tatlong kategory. Yung una po is um, physical. Dahil nga po, masakit siya, ganyan. Um, Umaga-umaga pa lang, may hirap nang bumangon. Um, Nakakapanibago po sa taon ko na ganun, mahirap gumalaw, hindi mo maabot yung mga nasa ibaba mo. Madalas, ganyan, hindi, ka, hindi po ako flexible para sa age ko. Tapos, pangalawa po yung emotional. Siyempre dahil nga po yung bata pa lang po ako, ganito na po yung na-experience ko. Marami pong times na narulungkot po ako, ganyan. Gusto ko pong mapag-isa na lang, ganyan. Kaya uh, madalas po ay eh, yung feeling na down ka po, ganyan. Tapos yung pangatla po is social. Dahil nga po, uh, Ganun yung na-experience namin na madalas masakit yung likod namin, yung mga kasukasuhan namin. Marami pong times na hindi po kami nagiging social na tao kasi mas pinipili po namin magpahinga, ganyan, or maging uh, i-isolate na lang po yung sarili namin kasi madalas dahil nga po uh, hindi visible yung aming kapansanan. Hindi po naiintindihan ng tao yung um, pain talaga, yung range ng pain na na-experience namin. So, Hi, good afternoon to all. Afternoon na ba? It's uh, or good morning pa rin. Good morning, morning to everyone. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of LMLR. You know, this is a sentimental journey for me to be back with, of course, serving PGH. So, uh, nakakataba ng puso. Let me start off by saying that. Anyway, for this morning, um, I'm going to focus on two specific conditions. One is osteoporotic vertebral fractures, which was alluded to earlier. And the other one is axial spondyloarthropathies. So we're going to be discussing um, pain control strategies for these two. And I know you might be wondering, bakit ito hindi yung the whole spectrum of uh, mechanical pain? So then uh, I'll be zeroing on that later on in my Next topic on axial spondyloarthropathies. But in the meantime, kasi naunahan ni Dr. Dave tungkol dun sa 80-year-old male na patient niya. And even if he had TB uh, as the final diagnosis, there must have been some osteoporotic component to it. But as we all know, bakit ganon? Bakit may pain ang osteoporosis when so many people may have it? And that's why it's considered a silent epidemic. And most patients present asymptomatically. However, 
for those who sustain a minor fall, wala nga major trauma doon, pwede nahulog lang from a standing height. They may develop fractures of the back and these are labeled as osteoporotic fractures, fragility fractures, or even low, low trauma fractures happening at the mid-thoracic level, T7 to T8, or the junction of the thoracic lumbar area. So this is T12 to L1. So ang tawag natin dito, acute vertebral compression fractures. Uh, and these are the ones that are associated with pain. Now, technically, these are actually stable because it does not involve the posterior vertebral arc and hindi common ang injury to the spinal cord. Ang description niya, it's crushing. Crushing pain, improving on lying down, and it does not radiate down the legs. So hahanapin ninyo ito kapag elderly ang pasyente or has had a previous fracture before. The good part about it is that two-thirds of the time, they will have spontaneous resolution of the pain in around three to six weeks. However, on the long term, they can cause severe pain disability, increased risk of secondary fractures, and even lead to higher mortality and hospitalization rates. Now, so, sabi ni Dr. Dave kanina, ito siguro yung one of those red flags because we're talking about the elderly. So, the way to diagnose osteoporotic vertebral fractures would be using an X-ray of the thoracolumbar spine. Normally, you should have um, well, the, the, the fracture in itself is defined as having more than 15% reduction in the height. And this balinon, you can start staging your fractures as to mild, moderate, or severe, depending on the degree of reduction in height. No? It's also described as either wedge, biconcave, or crush. And so that's how you diagnose or stage vertebral fractures. However, not all vertebral fractures may be from osteoporosis. So ang red flag ko regarding this would be, look when these fractures occur in persons who are not elderly. Also, if a solitary vertebral fracture is seen higher than the T4 level, now that's very unusual, it, um, it becomes relatively, uh, parang hindi na siya magiging, uh, different kung osteoporotic ang pasyente if there are other multiple, if there are other fractures at lower levels. So we're talking about a solitary vertebral fracture higher than T4. So you might say, so what do we think of pag ganun nga ang nangyari? So other causes of low bone, um, low bone um, mass will be osteomalacia, hyperparathyroidism, Granulomatous disease, as what was mentioned, pwedeng TB ito, hematologic diseases like multiple myeloma, infections, and metastatic cancer. So when we talk about pain management, I was looking for algorithms, and I didn't find any. Um, there was only one CPG by the American uh, Academy of Orthopedic Surgery in 2011. Uh, and then in terms of management, We'll have to separate the way we manage this as to the acute versus the chronic phase, only because in the acute phase, pain is experienced to be more severe. When they become chronic, pain is multidimensional, meaning you need to consider sensory, affective, and cognitive aspects of the patient, including physical disability from this. There will be at some, some point spinal instability, joint imbalance, and muscle tension. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but I'll just go through this in, uh, just to give you a little orientation on what we now know as the WHO pain analgesic step ladder. This was originally used for cancer pain, but we now use it for any, for even non-cancer conditions. I'll start off with a red box under. The first evaluation, as what Dr. Dave alluded to, was to evaluate the intensity of the pain. And you can do this by using a visual analog scale or a numeric scale. And we divide this into mild, moderate, or severe. Depending on the intensity, 
we can go to any of the steps. For example, step one, we only use non-opioid medications such as paracetamol and NSAIDs. Or if it's moderate, you can go to step two, which is the use of weak opioids or stronger do or smaller doses of strong opioids. And then may or may not use NSAIDs in paracetamol. Uh, and on the third step, kap kapag talagang severe na, that's the time we use strong opioids such as morphine. Now we were saying, ito pa akyat, when the pain is persisting or increasing. But in the case, for example, of an acute onset of the fracture, sometimes we use the reverse analgesia approach, meaning masakit na masakit na, baka hindi kayanin ng paracetamol or NSAIDs or even tramadol, then we have to use already strong opioids. But this should be only for a short duration because of its side effects. So as I mentioned, this is the way we do this uh, we approach this. This is very conservative. Uh, listed are the doses that we use for mild to moderate pain. There is paracetamol uh, preparations that are 650 milligram dosage forms, and we use this four times a day at, uh, at the most. Uh, you can use NSAIDs, and we don't use low dose. We use moderate to high dose in, in cases like for vertebral fractures. Now, intranasal calcitonin is... Um, the one that has moderate actually recommendation from the AAOS guidelines, but I've been looking for this medication locally. Apparently, it's not available anymore, but it's an intranasal spray, and we use this as 200 units, one spray once uh, in alternate nostrils for a maximum of two to four weeks. Now, as I mentioned, opioid preparations used for severe pain is only uh, given short term due to the serious adverse reactions that you may have, such as respiratory depression. Now, pag sinasabi namang adjunct pain therapy, these may be given as necessary. For example, if the patients have paravertebral muscle spasms, you may add on muscle relaxants. But be careful because these patients are elderly. They may have uh, dizziness, nausea, vomiting from uh, the use of muscle relaxants, which are specifically centrally acting. For those who may have radicular pain from nerve root compression, you may have to address this with anti-epileptic medications or those used for neuropathic pain. And we also may want to add on antidepressants for those who have already developed chronic neurologic pain or even depression because in most of these patients are prone to develop depression and statistics are as high as 40 percent but when you use this we use it at the lower dose this is something like 30 to 40 percent of the normal dose other pointers you may want to consider you need to treat, of course, the underlying osteoporosis to prevent future fractures. Now, I put a question mark after um, pain control. Does this really help pain control? I, um, there are con contradicting evidence regarding the use of uh, anti-osteoporotic medications for pain. But nevertheless, this still must be used, as I said, to control the progression of osteoporosis. Listed here are the medications that we give, supplemental calcium with vitamin D. If we always, our patients are uh, given bisphosphonates or the injectable denosumab given every six months. Uh, these are anti-resorptive medications. And if the patient really truly has severe osteoporosis, you may want to try teriparatide, which is a parathyroid hormone. Address the lifestyle problems of these patients. So osteoporosis is commonly seen among smokers, those with high alcohol intake, those who have uh, sedentary lifestyles and not taking a high calcium diet. Ortho orthotic bracing has always been asked, kailangan ba lagyan ng brace? We know that this helps stabilize the injured area by inhibiting spine flexion. But this is only good during the acute phase for of pain control, and we give it up to three months max if needed. Now, exercise can actually be started when pain is diminished. It helps prevent subsequent falls and injuries because it strengthens the back extensors and it improves overall posture and gait. In the evidence-based uh, recommendations, it has been said that they would prefer aquatic therapy 
uh, if you wanted to start exercise. Now, two other um, pain issues I wanted to bring up, the definition of persistent pain. You say that the patient is in persistent pain if after six weeks of medical management, they still uh, complain of uh, moderate to severe pain. So what should we do for these patients? Of course, we still continue medical management, but you may want to consider surgical options. And I will request Dr. Dave to come back after my lecture to talk about vertebral augmentation. Um, another def definition you need to know is chronic pain. Kailan sinasabing chronic na siya? This is kapag six, three to six months after the fracture, there still is pain. And so you need to further evaluate these patients to determine if the fracture is still metabolically active or if there are new fractures occurring and you will need an MRI for this. So a word about vertebral augmentation. This can be either vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty, and typically the patients we select for this are those with incapacitating pain who are unable to taper parenteral opioids and those who are not improving with uh, or are intolerant to oral opioids. And as we said, we cannot use opioids for a long period of time because of those serious adverse events. So I'll pause here and not talk about vertebral augmentation. As I said, Dr. Dave is going to um, discuss this more after my lecture, because at this point, I'd like to segue into inflammatory back pain and discuss axial spondyloarthritis. Now, you did see earlier in the, slates, in the slides of Dr. Dave that he was talking about almost 90% of patients having mechanical back pain. And he put that 1%, actually 1% to 4% of them will have inflammatory back pain. So ano ba yung difference nitong dalawa? The one that's common that we know, which is really, as we said, we saw statistics that 84% of patients in their lifetime will, uh, or, or the population will have mechanical back pain. So I'm going to talk about mechanical back pain, the last column. It can occur at any age. It's variable on onset. The features can be, you know, any which way, it can be upper, lower, mid back pain, comes and goes. But the difference is that it improves with rest. It's usually mild and short-lived. And so when you do ESRs and CRP, which are inflammatory markers, these are usually always almost normal. However, when you have inflammatory back pain, there are certain features that will help identify this. Ito na yung sinasabing red flag na kailangan maintindihan at matandaan because these are back pain presenting among less than 40 years old patients and persisting for more than three months. Sometimes they present with alternating buttock pain and they wake up at night, usually second half of the night, hindi na makatulog sa sakit. Ironically, ang kabaliktaran is it improves with exercise. In other words, it's exacerbated with rest Kanyang kapag tulog, hindi gumagalaw, sumasakit, and it improves with movement or exercise. Morning stiffness, it's moderate and persists for more than 30 to 45 minutes. So when you have your inflammatory markers done, they're usually elevated. So makita mo, malaking difference kaagad. It's persistent, it improves when you move it, and it only worsens when it's addressed. So why must you know and different patients with IBP? Because some of these may progress to become spondyloarthritis. As a matter of fact, one of the major criterion in the diagnosis of spondyloarthropathies is the presence of inflammatory back pain. So let me just show you statistics this time on axial spondyloarthropathies. Worldwide, it's around 0.5 to 1.9%. But tingnan natin ang US. They have statistics on those with chronic back pain. So we said uh, kanina yung acute may be as high as 84, 89%. But chronic, they're around 20% of the population. But among the 20%, inflammatory back pain presents as around in, uh, are seen in 5 to 6% of patients. Pero dun sa IBP, 
bababa na yan. 0.4 to 1.4 percent of them may develop into axial or progress to become axial spondyloarthropathies. Now, so ano pa itong spondyloarthropathies? It's actually a spectrum of uh, different conditions. Uh, they share common clinical and genetic features such as sacroiliitis, meaning there is inflammation specifically of the sacroiliac joint. Then you can also have inflammation of the emphysis. Emphysis is the point of connection between the bone and a ligament or a tendon. So pag namamaga and ang emphysis, that is called emphysitis. Then you can have extra articular manifestations, which I will enumerate later on. And then when you have this genetic marker, HLAB27, they're most, uh, most of the time positive for this. For this. Now, in medical school, we have been taught about um, you know, these four conditions, disease conditions, as what we know as the spondyloarthropathies. You have ankylosing spondylitis, writers, you have a psoriatic arthritis, and enteropathic arthritis. But right now, the way we sort of categorize it or classify them are whether they are axial, kanya tinatawag namin axial spondyloarthritis, meaning they present more with spine involvement compared to those with peripheral manifestations, such as skin or uh, even uh, dactylitis, which I will again define later on. But just to give you an idea, kung bakit yung natawag namin axial spondyloarthritis versus peripheral. Now, I know you might think this is self-serving, but I found this algorithm wherein when you do have chronic back pain and identify those with inflammatory back pain, we usually have HLA-B27 done first. And then, and that's why we're teaching you this, because not all areas will have a rheumatologist. You must evaluate for the other clinical features of spondyloarthropathies. All right, so uh, important yun, hanapin ninyo the presence of inflammatory back pain, HLA-B27, do inflammatory marker test determinations, ESR and CRPs, and then kung kakailanganin, and I'll, I'll show you why, uh, we'll need to do MRI and x-rays. And then that will be the basis for you to judge clinically as to whether these patients have axial spondyloarthropathies or not. So this is the ASAS classification that we use. As I said, you know, dito pa lang, unang una, we look for inflammatory back pain. That's the definition. Chronic persistent back pain, more than three months. Ang age of onset niya, less than 40 years old. Now, they may have either sacroiliitis on imaging using an MRI or an X-ray or an HLA-B27 test with um, at least one or two of those other spondyloarthropathy features. So, ano-ano nga ba yun? Um, Peripheral arthritis may be one of them. Nagkakaroon ng arthritis, let's say, of the knees, ankles, or even the hands. You have dactylitis, which are sausage-shaped digits. I'll show you pictures later on. And thesis, as I said, namamaga, yung point of attachment, more commonly found in the Achilles uh, tendon. Or if they have family members with uh, ankylosing spondylitis also. And then kapag nabigyan ng NSAIDs, Excellent response. You see immediately a, a good response from these patients. They may also have uveitis or skin, a skin condition uh, called psoriasis or inflammatory bowel disease in the form of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And as I mentioned, HLA-B27 positivity and an elevated CRP. Now, so I'm going to now just focused on axial spondyloarthritis because they both can present either non-radiographically at an early stage or radiographic because ang magiging problema lang dito, if you want to catch these patients early, unfortunately, an MRI would be the earliest way you can determine whether they have sacroiliitis or not. 
And that's why we label them as non-radiographic. Hindi pa nakikita sa x-ray ang sacroiliitis. But in a sense, and I understand that they may not be able to afford the MRI, then you'll have to clinically suspect that they do have this if they have the presence of those other features that I mentioned. Okay. Now, how, how would this look like? Um, on the left, as I said, the MRI would be positive for sacroiliitis. You can see that very clearly uh, on the sacroiliac joint. And on the other side, when they become radiographically evident, then you will see this on a plain X-ray. And when they're very advanced, when you do the uh, thoracolumbar X-rays, you will already see the syndesmophytes or those bridging things making, uh, this is the basis for what we call as bamboo spine. So ito yung mga itsura ng ibang features na kailangan hanapin. Enthesitis, as you can see, there is inflammation of that point of attachment of your Achilles tendon to the calcaneus. Ang dactylitis, mukhang longganis, the little sausages, the whole finger or the whole toe is swollen. And you can have uveitis and psoriasis and the presence of inflammatory bowel disease and the rest I've already mentioned. Uh, these are some of the imaging features that we look for in the MRI, bone marrow edema, subchondral sclerosis, sometimes erosions. And for x-rays, of course, uh, uh, or even with the MRI, you can see the syndesmophytes and ankylosis. Now, we were saying not all inflammatory bowel uh, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, inflammatory back pain will progress to spondyloarthropathy. So who are those at risk of progressing to this? Those who present with uveitis, the male sex also, and those with a family history of spondyloarthropathies. So you must be able to ask uh, your patients for a family history for these cases. So how do we treat spondyloarthropathies? And that's why I had to introduce those with predominantly axial manifestations and those with peripheral manifestations because based on this, we uh, treat them in a sense differently. For one, we said they have an excellent response to NSAIDs. So all patients must be given non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs together with non-pharmacological treatment such as physical therapy and exercise. Uh, patient associations are also very helpful. For those presenting with peripheral manifestations, local steroid injections sometimes are given, but we also can use uh, conventional disease-modifying agents. The one that's really Quite effective is sulfasalazine. Unfortunately, we don't have that locally. And we give this two grams in divided doses per day. But for both presenting with axial and peripheral manifestations, um, the second line therapy that we use are biologics in the form of either TNF alpha inhibitors or interleukin 17 inhibitors. And all throughout, they may be given, given of course, analgesics. And if necessary, some form of surgical intervention, which again, Dr. Dave will be helping me out. So in terms of biologic therapies, I did mention that the ones we currently use are targeted therapies in the form of anti-TNF and anti-interleukin-17 uh, drugs. The uh, IL-6 and IL-23 inhibitors have failed to show a clinical benefit, and ongoing are JAK uh, studies on using JAK inhibitors for axial spondyloarthropathies. So this is my last slide, and I'm just trying to emphasize here why we need to treat well our patients presenting with axial spondyloarthropathies. 66% of them experience fatigue. And 46% of them have moderate to severe, severe insomnia. 45% of them have switched to a less physically active lifestyle. And 24% of them retire early, mean age of around 36 years. So you can see that this, is, this can be a very debilitating uh, condition. So early Diagnosis, or if you catch them very early so that we can treat them at once, would be the key to management. Uh, so I, I probably just want to stop there. 
and just summarize and say that these are some unusual presentations of low back pain. And uh, we use the WHO pain analgesic step ladder as a guide for effective pain control. And I cannot overly emphasize the need to treat the underlying condition and not just resort to analgesics and anti-inflammatory medications for the treatment of patients who present differently. Uh, those who present with inflammatory back pain and in the elderly with osteoporosis who may have fractures. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, just to take over a bit from Lexi, uh, this is just a short overview of what we do um, surgically for osteoporosis and um, ankylosis spondylitis. So we we'll start with um, the 74-year-old male with severe low back pain who consulted me in the clinic after a fall about a week prior from standing height. The pain, it is very painful shifting positions from lying down to sitting to standing, relieved by lying so fine. Very common um, presentation again. No neurologic deficit. Past medical history about a year ago, um, he also had an, a history of fall, but uh, the back pain eventually got better after a month. Otherwise, it was unremarkable. Physical examination, systemic findings were essentially normal. There were no neuro deficits, but there was moderate midline tenderness at the thoracolumbar junction. So these were his x-rays. And we would note a compression deformity here of L. Okay. Um, I had an MRI done, and this is what it showed. Um, the L2, actually, this is a steer image. Uh, the L2 appears to be a healed fracture because you can see that the signal intensity is the same as the adjacent vertebrae. What turned out to be hyper intense or um, in, in, inflamed is actually T12. So E12 appeared to be the acute fracture. On the CT scan, um, the CT scan actually affirmed L2 to be an old fracture because you can see here that it has fused to L1. This is a very common finding that we see um, in patients who um, have a healed vertebral compression fracture. It usually fuses to the adjacent vertebra. T12, the compression deformity is actually also more um, visible here compared to the x-rays. So I had labs done. ESR, CRP were normal. Alkaline phosphatase was normal. Ionized calcium was normal. Vitamin D assay was low. The patient, unfortunately, could not tolerate tramadol. Um, he gets dizzy, gets nausea. Um, and he was not willing to use a brace because they tried doing that last year, and he could not really tolerate it. So. Are there other options? One of the more common options offered, um, which is actually mentioned in a lot of clinical practice guidelines, is that of cement augmentation in osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. And what does that mean? Essentially, cement augmentation involves, um, it's usually done percutaneously. A metal tube, a small metal tube is passed posteriorly going through the pedicle and into the vertebral body. And um, for vertebroplasty, what we, what we term as bone cement or polymethyl metacrylate, which is actually more of a medical grade plastic, is um, injected into the vertebral body. Okay. Um, this actually can be a bit controversial for some in some studies because you need a whole lot more pressure to inject viscous cement into the vertebral body. Sometimes that cement can get into the uh, nutrient arteries of the bone and uh, it can embolize. Um, and we've seen some, some patients with uh, cement embolus in the uh, pul pulmonary embolus from cement and some also with embolized vertebral arteries. So it's not... Uh, pretty picture, um, which is why 
they came up with balloon kyphoplasty, where you place a balloon inside the vertebral body to create your cavity first so that when you inject the cement, the pressures are much less. So this is actually the preferred procedure for um, the vast majority of orthopedic spine specialists in the country. So it's done uh, in, in the OR. We use fluoroscopic guidance to get a front and a side view. And then using trocar, so this is a jam 3D needle, we place the instruments progress, we progressively um, dilate the skin until we're able to place the proper instruments directly into the bone. So such that we're able to introduce this uh, balloon bone tamp into the vertebral body. One advantage of using the bone tamp is actually that it can, to a certain degree, reduce the fracture as opposed to vertebroplasty where um, it's very rare for that to, to happen. So we inflate the bone tamp and here you can see it, the height increasing. And we inject uh, cement into the vertebral body. And this is what uh, the post-op picture of our patient earlier with uh, with a bone cement inside the vertebral body of, L of T12. And we were able to get a bit of a reduction um, by doing this. So that's one of the more common procedures that's done for osteoporosis. For AS, on the other hand, it's, it falls under what we would term in spine surgery as adult spinal deformity because um, untreated AS can actually cause uh, Paracolumbar kyphosis and even cervical kyphosis in more than 30% of cases. The major goals for the surgery for the sagittal imbalance is to stop the natural course of the progression, restore the horizontal visual axis, okay, because most patients would be looking down, bring that um, center of gravity back normal, okay, and by doing that, you're hopefully you're you'll be able to lower the pain from the muscle fatigue, improve disability, and um, improve respiratory function. Okay, so we do this by doing spinal osteotomy. So literally, binabakbak namin yung buto. It's indicated for severe rigid coronal and sagittal plane deformities, taking into consideration the bone density, the goals uh, operatively, how much you need to straighten that patient out, and of course, the surgeon's experience and comfort level, because not it's, this is not a, not a common procedure done in our country. So there are a uh, few surgeons who have the kind of experience for um, this kind of a procedure. So it can vary anywhere from just do, taking out bone from the posterior, moving on to osteotomy as part of the of the vertebral body. Eventually, you can actually take out entire vertebral bodies doing what we call a vertebral column resection. So either one or sometimes even up to two vertebral bodies. Okay. And by doing that, hopefully you'll be able to achieve this. So from a deformity such as this one here, where the patient is actually looking down and since it's AS, it's fixed. So the patient is unable to look forward you can do posterior osteotomies to straighten out the lumbar spine. But if you do that, you'll still be left with that fixed deformity up here. So you'll eventually need to do surgery also here at the cervical thoracic so that you'll be able to have forward looking vision. So that's what one of the authors did for um, in, in their in, uh, study and they published this uh, where with the patient's head angle downwards, the eyes were looking downwards, they did an osteotomy posteriorly, taking out some of the posterior elements and they were applying implants at the back so that they were able to straighten out the patient's head and the patient's able to look forward. So like I said, it's not something that's commonly done. Um, frankly, I, I've only had to do this surgery for once or twice and I wasn't able to take pictures. So but this is a very similar case. Um, this is one of the more common ones that we do. And um, the principles are pretty much the same. So it's a patient with a 17 year old male with healed TB spondylitis. So T3 and T4 were fused in kyphosis. So 
you can see the amount of the kyphosis here, which is something that you will often see in patients with AS. So again, we did posterior osteotomies, taking out a lot of the posterior elements and placing implants to stabilize everything. And this is what it looks where you're able to achieve a much better um, amount. Of, the, the kyphosis looks much more natural um, postoperatively. This is another patient, um, 54 year old male. The spine was relatively fixed. He had previous surgery done abroad. And uh, over the years, the spine began tilting. So this is the front view, side view. Um, there were also some vertebral compression fractures here. So we, again, did some posterior osteotomies and apply, applied a longer set of implants so that we were able to restore the sagittal alignment to something which is more um, uh, optimal for the patient. So yeah, that's a brief overview for what we do, what what we do for uh, osteoporosis and what we can do for patients with AS. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Lexi and Dr. Dave, for those very very practical points that you raise in your lectures at para dun sa show and tell ni Dr. Dave na tutunay na mang kamangha mangha no so we have some questions in the Q&A box so we I, I just group some of them and we will address it we will address them um uh shortly so since uh, on na si Dave no very instructive no just to summarize we talked about low back pain that you know most cases it's mechanical but in some cases, it's not, as Dr. Lexi said. We have some questions here in the chat that talked about risk factors, no? And the questions pertain to pelvic tilt, weightlifting, obesity, lifting heavy loads. Do those predispose to low back pain? Or, ah, meron pang isa, spinal anesthesia. And what kind of low back pain emanate from those uh, conditions? To get, just to get spinal anesthesia out of the way. In general, it's not really painful. Yeah. It's up, okay? But of course, there is that small risk that you might get arachnoiditis after spinal infection, and arachnoiditis can be very painful. Uh, it can present as low back pain, even with radiculopathy. Um, and unfortunately, if you get arachnoiditis, it's very difficult to treat. But yeah. fortunately, it's very rare. So most patients, diba, na after pregnancy, it's really mechanical from, you know, the yeah, loss of... Yeah, from the baby itself. Yeah. I mean, that's what something about that the, I tell. Yeah, what right, about the about. other things? i sorry. Yeah. The other things, sitting for a long period of time, weightlifting, uh, pelvic tilt, are those risk factors for back pain? Any position, if you stay in it for a prolonged period, because you have certain group of muscles which uh, keep you balanced when you're sitting down, when you're standing up, when you're in any particular position. If you're in a prolonged position for a long time, the, only those muscles are working. So eventually they will get strained and ev eventually they will hurt. So it doesn't matter whether you're sitting down for a long time or standing for a long time, eventually it's going to start hurting. And the definition of prolonged is one R. Anything more than one hour is considered prolonged. So, Pwede na tayong mag-back pain ngayon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lexi. No? Yeah. So, yeah, anything that changes the biomechanics can actually, or compromise the biomechanics can actually exactly. contribute to the mechanical back pain. Dr. Lexi, uh, somebody's asking, what if the back pain happens after prolonged walking and then it has radiation? Does that qualify as a red flag, radiation to the lower legs? And, well, I'll just qualify it first. Now, for one, I will label that as mechanical. Hindi siya inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And radiation might mean that there could yung the, the term na iipit yung ugat, it's actually probably nerve root compression and maybe from different causes. Uh, consider a disc problem, maybe. But, but uh, hard to just say uh, exactly what it is. But the way it sounds like uh, might might be a disc problem. Yeah. Yeah, the, the history is actually classic for spinal stenosis, um, which is actually very benign. Mm -mm. Yeah. So, 
marami ho kasing differentials even for mechanical back pain. When we talk yes. about mechanical back pain, it's not one condition. It's yes. many conditions. And I would agree that sounds like spinal stenosis. Should they be alarmed? Do they need to run to us? Or pwedeng maglakad lang papunta sa atin? <laughs> You, you know, remember what we were saying? Ang main differentiation between mechanical and inflammatory, it's technically really good rest. So malaking bagay, just, uh, just consider the amount of rest you actually you actually have. Minsan din, uh, muscle tension in itself might take some time bago, bago ma-address. Ma uh, I've had patients na maybe ang minimal ang kanilang mga uh, physical uh, you know, the, the, the kind of physical work that they do. But they have a lot of mental things going on, a good from work and all that. So everything contributes to having back pain, very nonspecific. And, and that's why Mahirap began siya ng, you know, some kind of one-size-fits-all strategy yeah. to help you out. Uh, technically, you rest, and then the others could be using low, I'm saying low, low doses of maybe your favorite anti-inflammatory, even just paracetamol might do. But you'll be surprised. Most of this is they're self-limited and it keeps on recurring. Can you just think back on your exercise and figure out what are you doing wrong? Mommy, I'm going exercise, but mali yung technique. Yeah. Uh, you just copy it from a video or you copy it online and you think tama siya, pero mali ang execution. So I, I would still first consider that before getting alarmed and saying there's something wrong. And then if it persists, I think that's the that's the whole idea here. Dr. Dave explicitly explained that, that if it's persistent and months na hindi pa rin nawawala, itong usapan na yun, baka that's the time you should go see uh, your physician. Okay. Um, is already eating pain, like if it already eats to the knee, is that already considered uh, neuropathic? Uh, or is that, I'm sorry, is that considered a red flag? Because somebody is asking one to two hours uh, knee pain after one to two hours of walking. Is that considered radiating pain? Um, Dave, would you like to answer that? Not necessarily. Um, it depends a lot on, I mean, Bottom line, the best the, the best person uh, to make that judgment call would actually be the examining physician if it if yeah. there really is a red flag. Because it could mean anything. I mean, knee pain while walking, that could just be osteoarthritis and have nothing to do with the back. Yes. Yeah, so pwedeng yung prolonged standing itself, di ba? Is, is yes. the stress to the knee as mom Lexi is saying. Right. Yeah. We have some interesting questions. I think these are from uh, practitioners also. Uh, one of them is on the use of medications. Like, I know that there's a lot of patients, with even doctors, who hesitate on the use uh, of opioids. So the question is, how do you advise patients who are a bit apprehensive about osteoids? opioids when you want, in fact, to suggest this to them for severe back pain? Mm, okay. Uh, they're very hard to convince them, actually, because these are the, 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 these strong opioids are usually given IV. So they will have to be in a hospital setting because we have to monitor for those serious adverse events. However, having said that, I, I um, usually hindi naman how, how can I say this? Um, these patients will want immediate pain relief. So, and if you tell them that we'll try first something conservative like tramadol or uh, a combination of uh, high-dose anti-inflammatory medications, and if they don't work, then they have no other resort except to use stronger medications such as opioids. But we have to explain to them that to assure them that they will be monitored for any of those serious adverse events and that these should be used only for the short term. Pag na-relieve na yon, I would immediately uh, wean them off strong opioids and then go to the weaker ones and always use adjunct, adjuvant therapy para all mechanisms of actions will complement each other. So what about you, Dave? Any specific tip for that? In general, if uh, the patient 
has the really bad pain that requires opioids, most likely that's not normal run-of-the-mill back pain. There's something else. So I would be more... Uh, I would have a high index of suspicion for other issues and I'd be looking for what is really causing the pain. I, I have never encountered a patient with benign back pain who needed opioids. So kung talagang severe back pain, no? Usually, as Mom Lexi said, there would be less hesitancy talaga. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, and uh, no, uh, as outpatient, we, we don't recommend that. That will mean, ito na yung red flags na sinasabi ni Dave. Yeah. Baka malignancy, that will be one of the first things that will come to mind. So like, uh, and in cancer pain, you know that they can be very severe. So they might be the patients who have to use stronger uh, opioid medications. So we circle back to getting the diagnosis, the right diagnosis, so that uh, the pain can be addressed. Because um, uh, as you said, if it's a cancer pain, then definitely it ibang usapan na to. So maybe instead of focusing on convincing people who have a vas of ape to use opioids, the bigger focus is why is this happening, right? Okay, let's let's circle back to uh, the topic of Mom Lexi. Um, you talk, you alluded to telling symptoms of inflammatory back pain, and one of our attendees, in fact, says that. Uh, they have pain in their buttocks, specifically the right buttock, and it's on and off. Does that mean it's sacroiliitis or are there other possibilities for buttock pain? My uh, can be, again, uh, always put it into context. So I would label it as inflammatory back pain. If not only do you have alternating buttock pain, nagigising ka ba sa gabi? Uh, sa sobrang sakit, you know, you can have that. And are you less than 40, 45 years old? Is Has the pain been persistent for more than three months? And that's why it's a whole criteria that we use for inflammatory back pain. Now, if you have buttock pain, it might be a localized problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have, a, you know, bursitis, ischial bursitis, or some form of muscle strain in, in, in your glutes. So again, we'll have to be evaluated by your physician just to find out what exactly would be the cause of the buttock pain. Uh, for all we know, again, might just be a localized problem and, and not inflammatory in nature, in, in terms of part of the inflammatory back pain uh, criterion. So we really have to look at this as a whole, no? Is it, yeah. uh, what are the other characteristics aside from the buttock pain? It's yeah. twelve eighteen. We're over time, so I'll just limit this to uh, one more question, no? And we'll try to answer the rest of the questions in the chat uh, later. Uh, there's one more question here on. Um, let me see. Oh, if you suspect that in fact the patient has inflammatory back pain and in, maybe the patient has AS, but they cannot afford MRI, what's the next best thing to do? Um, that, that has been the issue. And that's the, uh, as we said, we mentioned non-radiographic, meaning pick up lang very early via um, MRI. And then they become radiographic, medyo, medyo advanced na, nag progress na. So unfortunately, without those imaging, uh, it's not that we can't do anything for our patients. If you clinically suspect them to have already axial spondyloarthropathies, ganun na, meron na siyang dactylitis, may uveitis na siya, you, you go ahead and treat. I will not hesitate just because the patient cannot afford an MRI. Sa totoo, realistically, when my patients can't even, you know, they have limited resources, so I have to choose between an MRI or using those resources to treat, I will forego the MRI and just tell them that why don't we try treatment and see if you get better because the clinical improvement will probably support your diagnosis yeah. of an axial spondyloarthropathy going on. I agree with that totally. No? Um, some, uh, especially since we all know that the first line treatment for axial spondyloarthropathy is not really very difficult naman to, to mm -hmm. apply. Um, we have some more questions on surgical treatment, but I know, Dave, diba you have courses in orthopedics? Baka you want to plug? 
uh, uh, where can they get information in this and the part of our ortho friends? Ah, uh, well, the the UPPJH Department of Orthopedics has a Facebook page, so you can just search for us there. Um, if you have any particular questions or you're interested in our activities, yeah, we have a big um, up review and update course uh, coming this September, um, which yes. is directed towards uh, orthopedic surgeons called or, called Orthorox or Review of Core Knowledge. So, yeah. yeah, if you are so, interested in ortho, yeah, please attend. So or perhaps for those of us who are trying, who are consulting Dr. Dave regarding their findings here in the chat, you can suggest it to your orthopedic uh, doctors as well, no? Orthorox, that's the name. Para po, uh, they can better communicate with you as well regarding your concerns regarding your back pain. We also have quite a number of questions on um, interventions, uh, specifically exercises to strengthen the back. Thank you for that suggestion. We'll, we'll, uh, perhaps we do need another session with our physiatry friends no? for us to work together in terms of suggesting interventions to uh, back pain, uh, how managing their back pain through or helping manage their back pains through exercise. Medyo marami po, po, po itong ano, questions natin um, here. So, but um, uh, again, we'll try to answer some of these in the chat box. There's also some concerns being raised about not getting their CPD credit points. Kindly make sure you send us the correct email addresses or um, you can message us through our email and we'll try to re uh, answer your response there. So thank you very much, Dr. Dizon and Dr. Tanke Torres for sharing your expertise, practical knowledge, and wisdom in terms of managing basic patients with back pain. We've learned a lot certainly this morning. We've been reminded of the importance of a focus history in ensuring that we're able to identify red flags. We've also been reminded that not everything that you see in, in the x-rays necessarily the cause of your back pain or that we need an x-ray for everybody who has back pain. No. We were also informed by Dr. Torres about what are the cardinal signs to look out for to suspect inflammatory back pain and giving us tips and strategies into how we escalate treatment for back pain starting from mild to severe. And we were again uh, given the very good pearl of ensuring that before we treat continuously or aggressively, we look for the specific cause of the back pain because perhaps that's where the gap will go. So, or the gap is rather. So thank you very much again, Dr. Dizon and Dr. Torres. I'm sure our audience learned a lot from you today. I could see the people in the room with me um, looking intently at the pictures that you have presented. We would like to thank the Information Management Service Network team of UP Manila and our sponsors, Novartis and Celtrion Philippines, for making this webinar possible. Thank you to the 1,000 people who are in the webinar, plus the people who had to be accommodated through FB Live. Our, our links for the evaluation forms are in the chat. Please make sure to answer them. Um, we hope to see you all on August 17th for next LMLR webinar on hand pain. Hand pain naman, from the back to the hand. So again, Thank you very much, everybody, for sharing your lunch period with us.